Thank you very much uh, for those highlights. I participated in the accountability group and the uh, discussion was lively and rich. And um, I know that some of the recommendations that came up in those groups, uh, we now have to find a way to take forward. I think what I was struck most by over the last two days was the energy in the room. Uh, it was palpable. And that's what makes me believe that we do have an opportunity to make history here, to make preventable child deaths a thing of the past. I know it's an ambitious goal, uh, but as we heard from Minister Tedros this morning, it is attainable if we believe it is attainable, if we have the will. So the first step is to imagine a world in which no child dies needlessly from illnesses and diseases that can be prevented or treated. Now this may seem like a random thought, but how many of you are Star Wars fans, George Lucas fans? Any, 10, 12? It's a random transition here, but the reason I say that is a few years ago, um, I'm a big Star Wars fan, I was very disappointed with one aspect of the Star Wars trilogy. And for those of you who haven't seen it, I'm gonna give away the story, I'm sorry. But despite all of the fantastic worlds and futuristic sort of intentions that George Lucas imagined and brought to life in those movies, the mother of Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia died in childbirth. So I was really struck at that moment by the fact that a director with such a great capacity for imagination opted to perpetuate the myth that maternal mortality is somehow an immutable constant, regardless of time, context, or the great many interventions that Lucas's imagination might have conjured. So I say that to point out to you that I recall when giving birth to my baby in India in 1985, um, that the nurses, and I delivered in a public hospital in New Delhi, um, treated the whole event as a high-risk event. Even though I was, you know, 28 or 29 years old, and um, I didn't perceive, I had no symptom that put me at high risk, but the childbirth in their minds was a high-risk event, both for the infant I was about to deliver and for me. And um, it makes me realize that we have to come a long way in many parts of this world where it's still imagined to be a high-risk event if we are, in fact, to create a world in which no mother or child dies due to a preventable cause. Um, so we have been in, united in our vision of a world in which the death of a mother or a child is the exception rather than the norm. Over the last two days, we have discussed the many ways in which it can be done. It has been exhilarating, I will say. So many nationalities, constituencies, and causes gathered under one roof over two days. To recommit, to work together, to build a world that confidently expects that every mother will survive childbirth and that every child will celebrate her or his fifth birthday. I believe that this meeting has taken us forward in terms of rebuilding our confidence in each other. It has reinforced our belief that we can, we must, work together as different constituencies, tracking our collective progress without losing sight of our own individual issue-specific goals. In the case of Gavi, the accessibility and affordability of vaccines. In the case of rollback malaria, the fight against malaria. We may have different causes, but we should now come together to track our progress against that bigger goal of preventing child deaths. Christian Baiza summed it up nicely when he said, we need to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. We've worked separately for far too long. That is our call to action. Working together, each and every one, to bring about an unprecedented reduction in preventable child deaths, to renew the promise to give every child the best possible chance to survive. We are thrilled at UNICEF that so many of you have pledged to join us under a banner of a promise renewed. As of this afternoon, 54 governments have signed the pledge. <laughs> the 
renewing their commitment to their country's children. If others are interested in signing the pledge, it will be available here and Kent will be responsible for making sure that we take the historic photographs as you sign it. Uh, so do come by onto the stage at the end of this session. Um, we all know that our work has just begun. We now have to go back to our respective jobs, institutions, countries, communities, and translate the ideas, strategies, and aspirations discuss discussed over the past two days. What do we do on Monday? What's new? What will we do differently? There is no silver bullet. It will require action by all of us, all of the constituencies represented in this room, as well as those who are not here with us. We need to work beyond the field of health, linking up with efforts in the areas of education, nutrition, water and sanitation, and many others. And we need to focus on what Dr. Tedros and others over the last two days have identified as key ingredients for success. National ownership, the courage and willingness of governments to engage citizens in an open and transparent dialogue on the progress made on child survival and the challenges that remain, evidence-based plans that focus high-impact strategies and interventions where they are needed the most, real-time monitoring systems at the national and sub-national levels, investments in innovation, scaling up technologies and strategies that show strong potential to greatly improve existing products and processes, and finally, community-level mobilization and accountability empowering families, especially women, to demand the interventions and treatments that will save and improve their own lives and those of their children. The actions we take may vary by context, but they will advance a common goal, to allow every child everywhere a chance to celebrate her or his fifth birthday. Ultimately though, what counts, what will keep us going, is our personal commitment. Each of us has our own motivation for making and keeping that commitment. For some, it may be the memory of a child you saw on your travels, a grieving mother perhaps, a child who died needlessly in childbirth. For others, it may be the hope that you have for your own child or your nieces and nephews who you ho hope will grow up into a world in which no child dies from preventable causes or conditions. I make my commitment in memory of my paternal grandmother and as a promise to my father. My father grew up motherless. His mother died when he was 10 years old. She died at the age of 33, soon after giving birth to her 11th child, only five of whom survived. My father is 89 years old today. His mother's memory and his perseverance fuel my motivation to do everything within my power to spare every child the pain and vulnerability caused by the loss of a mother and to spare every mother the heartbreaking loss of a child. I've often described my grandmother's death as a case of maternal mortality and my father inevitably reminds me, no honey, she died grieving for her dead children. As I said at the outset, we have to believe that we can do it. If we believe, we will succeed. Before I conclude, I want to extend heartfelt thanks to USAID. Where is my friend Amy Batson? Yeah. Is she in the room? There she is. I know there was a big team at USAID working hard behind the scenes to make this event happen today and for organizing and coordinating all of us so that we had a successful meeting. But I personally want to thank Amy Batson, who has been my constant companion over the past few months as we tried to put this together. Amy, without your energy and vision, none of this would have been possible. Thank you very, very much.